Yes. Okay, we started. Yay! Okay, another episode of the Bitchcast, and I have Jason Santa Maria. Hello. Yay! Um, so, Jason, I'm, I'm going to probably brutalize exactly what you do, and I think I have my own um, description for what you do. But uh, I'm going to say you're a designer. Um, I'm going to say you're also a serial, serial co-founder. It feels like you've co-founded a couple of things, right? Uh, yeah, just a couple, I would say. Yeah, so um, yeah. a book apart and editorially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, anything else that you've kind of started along those lines or helped out with? Um, well, I've, I've helped out with a lot of, a lot of things, a lot of uh, startups and a lot of sites and some, some that were never publicized and some. I've, I've been working behind the scenes pulling strings for a long, long time. Right, so those are kind of your um, kind of your two babies, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. Um, <laughs> so weird term. Uh, so when it comes to um, how, how did you get into like actually starting uh, to do something along those lines, like editorially or any of those things that are you know a book apart? Like, what was the what made you want to do something along those lines? Like. Was it a conversation with a friend? Was it like a good idea? Like, how did you start and how did you finish? More importantly, oh, it's all of those things. I mean, that's n no idea is really made in isolation, um, at least not in my world. Uh, it's always conversations at the bar, at lunch, over over the internet. It's conversations all over the place, and just seeing if there are other people that have the same desires and needs that you do, and if you know it makes sense to get together and make something. Um, I think the time that I spent at Typekit probably sent me down this road, seeing that you could put something together from nothing and launch it and, you know, maybe try to make a business or or do something larger. And it's just interesting and super challenging to do something on your own and not, not be beholden to a client or anyone, but, you know, to be making the decisions and steering the ship. You, do you think that you are your worst own client then? Uh, probably, but I, I like to think maybe maybe that's not always the case. I mean, I, I, I'll always be pushing myself to try and be better and, you know, to do the best work that I can, but um, I don't know. It's definitely not debilitating like, like uh, a saying like that would suggest. <laughs> like make the logo bigger a hundred yeah. times over? <laughs> Right? No, no. <laughs> <You're> like, no. <laughs> no, no. This, the, I mean, there comes a point in time, especially if you're the only designer, like I was at uh, Typekit and like I am at editorially in a book apart, where I don't really have to have those discussions anymore. I can just make make the logo as big as I want it to be, or make anything else look the way that I want it to be, and for the most part, it just stays that way because it's only one small part of you know what it is that we're making. Right. Um, how do you so in terms of, of doing something like editorially or or book apart or how do you I'm assuming you're working on something on your own. It's an idea that you want to conceptualize and you know you have some kind of a road path of some sort. Maybe maybe not. Maybe it's just throwing it out there and it sticks. And the next thing you know, you've got to figure that out. But how do you how do you keep yourself motivated to work on those kind of things? Because for a lot of people, they see those things as something they might do on the side, right? Like they might have a full-time job and then they have this idea that they're kind of trying to work out and, and make happen. Um, you know, how did, how did you keep staying the road to, you know, actually finishing, um, finishing a product? Well, I don't think I've, I don't think I have finished a, pro a project or a product yet. I mean, um, I think that for a long time I worked on things that weren't really able to consume all of my time. Mm -hmm. they were they could only ever be as big as a side project because there just wasn't enough work in them and a book of parts a really good example you know once the website is done and once the the book design is done um, the amount of work that goes into it is sort of you know peaks and valleys there isn't a whole lot of day-to-day -day maintenance to run the site or or to run run the books or something like they, they they just they're there they're products that you have to ship but you know then it'll ramp up and I'll be really busy for a little while working on the next book or something like that. So in between those areas, I just kind of stacked up a lot of similar projects that didn't need to be a full-time project. Right. 
how do you how do you prioritize what you want to work on? Like I'm sure that you sit down and you have I'm sure with your amazing mind, you sit down and you have tons of great ideas and you know, oh that should be that should be made, that should be made, we should be doing this. How do you prioritize what you think um, between a good idea and a good idea worth executing? Oh, uh, well, I mean, uh-huh. the the day to day stuff is like, you know, I work on whatever needs tending, whatever is like the squeakiest wheel is is yeah. gonna get it that day. But um, in general, I kind of start by doing whatever I'm interested in that day, like wherever my motivation is, wherever my um, momentum really is. You know, if I have something that I really want to get out of my head and and down on the paper or down on the screen, I want to work on that because that's going to be where I'll be most productive. Is there, um, is there any kind of, um, have you found any solution for yourself personally for those moments where you're not motivated? Um, whether you want to call it being burnt out or any of those kind of things, like, is there anything that you found that works for you? Yeah, I, I found that, I mean, if you, if you have the ability to, if you have the luxury to, to just step away from everything for a little while, especially, it's not even so much the work, it's the everything else. It's the Twitter, it's, it's all of the, the emails and all of the things that you're supposed to be reading. And if you can just step away from those things that you've fabricated as these obligations that need to be tended to, um, I think that it, it, it lets your mind have a little bit of space to breathe. And sometimes that means getting away entirely and just stepping outside and going somewhere or just not being in front of your computer. Um, but I also know that like a few years ago I felt as though I wasn't, I wasn't super motivated because I was sort of bored in the, the rut that I had fallen into. And it was around that time that I started taking on new projects and new things that I hadn't done before, like a book part and like Typekit. And uh, I started teaching and I was just trying to figure out if there was something, you know, just a short like parallel hop to where I was that might be more interesting and might be more enriching at that time. And that was another means to get out of that that sort of uh, debilitating rut. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I think a lot of people struggle with the whole idea of being um, burnt out or, you know, getting in a rut. And, and everyone's always like, step away, do all these things. And sometimes you don't have the luxury of doing that, um, you know, because of a deadline or whatever else might come up. But I think that's all, like, super good advice, just the idea of, um, switching it up, maybe. Yeah. Also, when that happens, I mean, I mean, I, I, I get up off uh, like out of my my chair and I just go for a walk. Sometimes that'll always free up my mind. But I think that it's also important to know that like, no, no project is the end of the world. If you don't get it this time, cut your losses. It sucks, but you know, not everything's going to be a winner. And the most important thing is that you can move on and be, you know, at least as good as you can be for the next project. Because if you, if you can't, you know, gather up some semblance of motivation and who you are for that next project, you, you're not even going to want to be in the industry. That, that's like full-on burnout. Yeah. Um, as a designer, are there any design trends that you've seen in the last year or two years where you're just like, please, no more of that? Like, can this be over? Oh, yeah. I mean, the obvious one is just all the, the flat flat design stuff. It's just, it's really, it's really important. It's just, uh, it's super misguided and um, it's okay. really, inf- it's really unfortunate. I think it's misguided because um, a lot of people are doing it just because they're seeing it everywhere and they're wanting to be a part of that same visual fabric. Not so much that it makes sense to, to, to do it or to, you know, that it makes sense for their application or their website or whatever it is that they're making. Um, and it's unfortunate because uh, it's so easy to do very poorly and um, still have the same feel. Like, it's, it's going to look the same as everything else, and you don't even know that it's not working as well as it could be. Um, and iOS 7 on the iPhone is a really fantastic example of just um, really misguided design sensibilities that impact the interactions uh, in a very real way. It's just a horrible experience. Um, even being able to tell what what is an interface element, what isn't, and and the design is just so sloppy. Um, it's yeah, really like clickable buttons, right? Like the idea of like what is a clickable button? Suddenly, our whole understanding of 
what indicates a clickable button is totally different now. Yeah, yeah. There was a very different uh, moment over the holidays. I know everyone like you know goes to their parents and they like do the tech support thing and and they uh, use all the browsers and everything else for their parents. Yeah, and teaching um, teaching your your family and your friends who aren't as tech savvy how to use something like an iPad or or an iPhone. You know, when you're sitting around. Um, became all of a sudden way more difficult in iOS 7 um, because you'd be like, tap on that button, and it's like, no, that doesn't look like a button, or, you know, what is it that you're talking about? Because everything became so abstracted. We went from one side of the spectrum to the other and not really understanding what was good about being on the one side of the spectrum before we left it. Yeah, and I think specifically within that kind of ecosystem and in that environment, it's such a switch within that environment in OS and, in, you know, in that OS in general that it's hard like my I was at my parents and my mom wanted an app and she my mom doesn't even know how to download an app okay she knows she knows how to do email and that's it so she's on her iPad she wants this app has no idea so I'm going to teach her and then I realized to get the app she needs to upgrade so then I'm at this problem where if I upgrade her it's going to be the new new iOS <laughs> she so so like I had 20 minutes where I was just like it was like the worst decision I've ever had to make in my life because like if I upgrade her, I don't know if she's going to survive this. Like, she's going to be lost, yeah. Right? And so anyways, I ended up upgrading her. It was just good. Like she knows little enough that it didn't bother her because she doesn't know where things are. So she knows email and she knows like, you know, the Safari icon, which mm-hmm. once again, new one really confused her. But, you know, so I was okay. But had she known just a little bit more, we would have been in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. That's just one of those things where, I mean... You know, people talk about flat design. They talk about simplicity, right? And it's a, making things a little bit more simple and a little bit more about the information and you know, all whatever blah 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 you want to talk about. But I agree to a certain extent where if everyone's going to be doing that, it's all gonna it's going to be hard to have any kind of variation. Like, well, that 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 and those qualities aren't aren't exclusive to a flat UI. I mean, you yeah. can have simplicity, you can have clarity in your interfaces, and not, uh, you know, actually put, put put things in that will reduce the effectiveness of interacting with it. Yeah, I mean, you know, on the other hand, seven months create a whole new, well, I guess it's probably longer than seven months, but, you know, it's, oh, it's a whole conversation in itself, isn't it? Well, yeah, oh, I, I get it. I totally get it. But, I mean, if there was a day when a designer had to sit down and decide, you know, we're using these typefaces, we're using these weights of typefaces, and this is how big the type's going to be, and this is what the colors are going to be. Those are decisions that had to be made at some point, and yeah. uh, I think that the where they landed was really unfortunate because you could spend a very short amount of time just reviewing the entirety of the OS and just seeing all of the different patterns that were reinforced because of those decisions. Yeah, someone, someone did that. There's a Tumblr for that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And it's actually a very well curated Tumblr. It's like very, I hate that word too, I said curated, but it's a very like, I mean, everything that's posted and written is very thoughtful, like extremely thoughtful. So it's not just, you know, bitching for the sake of bitching. It's actually pretty informational. That's good. Um, so so I asked you about stuff that you hated in terms of mm-hmm. friends or stuff that you disliked, because hate might be a bad word. Um, what about stuff that uh, that's happening that you, that you like or that you want to see more of? Oh, uh, I, I think I, I'm still very interested in what's happening in straight up in straight up web design. Um, I'm still enamored by responsive web design in many ways, and it might just be because for many people it's a return to thinking about typography as a as a big player in in a design, and that's that's something near and dear to my heart. Um, one of my favorite things as of late, uh, I'm really into the the changes that are happening over at the New York Times. I think the design team over there is doing really fantastic work, um, not only from visual design standpoint, but um, uh, interaction design standpoint too. They're really making some some interesting decisions, and I think um, the way that they're iterating and building upon what they're doing is is also a good model for for many publications. I mean, they're acting more like a startup. Um, which is is really fascinating. Yeah, I agree. The stuff that they're putting out is beautiful. Whether it's really complex, like Snowfall, or if it's something a little bit, it's just more of like, more, I don't know, beautiful kind of 
storytelling or, you know, more of a magazine kind of layout, whatever it may be. I think I love what they're doing. I think they're doing a good job. Mm-hmm. Um, most overused font right now. Most overused font? Yeah. Not that it's right or wrong, just most overused. So it could be a lovely font, but it's most overused. Uh, I, I, are we talking about print or web design? Talking about web design. Talking about web design, prob- uh, probably something like Proxima Nova. It's used very, very heavily, um, and I use it too, and I, I love it. Um, the whole family of Proxima Nova is pretty fantastic. But, Everyone I've yeah. met loves that font. They have this like crazy love affair with mm-hmm. that. Well, it's it's because it's a very it's a very neutral typeface. It doesn't yeah. have um, you know a whole lot of uh, overdone style or anything like that, so it's really easy to apply it to most anything. Um, in the same way that people, you know, love Helvetica because it doesn't really say anything, uh, it can just be plugged into any design. A uh, font that uh, a lot of people use that you are not a fan of, or wouldn't use if you had to. Oh, there are there are plenty of those. Uh, one have- one 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 thing that I hate um, is uh, is the usage of the font Lobster. Um, uh- it's one of the ones you just find on Google Fonts. It's not a bad font by any means. Um, I think the thing that bugs me about it is people uh, type out their company name in it, and then that becomes their logo, and a lot of people do that, and that somehow bothers me more than most anything else. Um, but also Helvetica. Helvetica is just so so overdone, um, which which in one case is fine. It's used everywhere, and that's that's okay. But I think the thing that bothers me about it most is whenever someone designs something, when a designer makes like templates for something or makes uh, um, you know some sort of like poster series or something, it just becomes the default choice. And I feel like that's that's one of the sloppiest things that you can do as a as a designer. I think it's oh th- that would really bother me. <laughs> I like how you chose Helvetica and offended like everyone out there. It's awesome. Good, 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 yeah. good. I, I, th- I think any any designer worth wor- worth anything should not be using Helvetica. Um, Damn. Yeah, it 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 just isn't it isn't useful to use. It's it's especially I mean given some of the uses um, people are people are using for it because it, it it's not a very legible font. It's not a very um, Good font for interfaces, for copy, for most anything. Um, yeah, it's 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 just not a very good choice, especially in this day and age. There's so many wonderful, wonderful choices. Um, if you're going to design something and you know use type, why not choose to actually say something with the design rather than say nothing? Um, especially for text. Text is the stuff that needs to say something. Right. That's um. I love it. I love it. I've never heard anyone this Helvetica. It makes me so incredibly happy. Mm. Um, that's awesome. Uh, you speak quite a bit, right? Still, mm-hmm. I think. Um, how how do you come up with a topic for a lot of your like presentations? Do you find that it's um, a result of the things that you've been working on, or top of mind, or um, like? You know, how do you how do you figure out how you're going to formulate a talk and what's going to be around it? Uh, it's usually something that I've been working on or mulling over. Like the one of the talks I've been giving more recently was about how my process had changed from working at an agency to working at a startup. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like when I can speak more from my own experience, it's a it's a lot more useful for me because mm-hmm. I get to really understand where I've been and, and what I'm working on, but I feel like I also have a much uh, easier time coming up with examples and, and getting through the meat of what it is I want to say rather than fabricating a talk that I don't really have a, a stake in. Yeah. Do you have a process when you sit down to start a talk or formulate what you're going to talk about? Like, do you... Oh, God. Because I know no. for me, like, I just write bullet points and then people think I'm insane. I write bullet points and then I just... I present in a very different way, but I write bullet points and then that's it. I don't script anything I'm going to say. I don't whatever. I just I have a sense of what I'm going to say and then I'll figure it out. Uh, I I follow a similar process. I think in writing the talk, I'll usually either sit down and write kind of an outline, mm-hmm. um, or um, every so often I'll write more like an article and then see if I can distill that into something. But then I'll just take the outline and I'll start putting it onto 
keynote slides, you know, one, one bullet point per slide, and I'll actually try and do a run-through of the talk and see if it's something that I can very easily just talk through, you know, no script or anything like that, and just kind of feeling my way through um, and kind of revise from there. And once I can get, like, a narrative, you know, in place, I'll refine it and, and build it out uh, based off of that. But my presentation style is kind of similar um, where I don't want to, I don't want to be reading, I don't want to have notes, I just want to know my talk well enough, and I use those slides as sort of trigger terms so that once each one comes up, I'll remember the point that I want to make, and I'll just ad lib it right there. Yeah. Have you ever seen someone pull out a laser pointer during a presentation? I have, yeah. And it's, I mean, most presentation remotes have the laser pointers, and it's useful when you need it, but not, not any more than like a one-time. Yeah. You know. Between, between that, um, which makes me laugh hysterically, and once again, sometimes you need it, depending on trying to point out a specific element on a page or something, but um, between that and uh, uh, people putting up bullet points and then reading the bullet points, you know, those two things to me, I just, oh man, I just laugh, I can't even help it, because it's not, it's not that it's a bad presenter, it's just, you know, you, people are there to hear you speak about things, Mm -hmm. Not necessarily to read. You don't need to read what's on the screen for them. It's exactly. Especially if you have a whole bunch of bullet points. So I always kind of exactly. laugh. Exactly. Which, which in some ways is is it's fantastic for speaking, um, but it's not good for the people who like to look at slide decks later, because yeah. my my slide decks will have like you know just like one word on a slide, and it won't make any sense because you're not hearing the minute that I'm talking about that one word. Um, Whereas the bullet point slides work fantastically when you throw them online. Right, and that's, so I've been struggling with that same thing because like, my slide deck is usually 100 images or 100 GIFs. Like, that's literally all it is. So, but obviously I'm saying things in between that. And so what I've been doing lately, whether it's in Keynote or PowerPoint or whatever, but I've been writing out like a whole diatribe under every single slide. And I don't use them when I'm talking. I use them after the fact. So when I post mm -hmm. it, I post it with notes and it becomes like a little story. Yep. And so that actually makes a little bit more sense because people are like, oh, yeah, you posted your slides, but it's just images. And I was like, yep. I told you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's smart. And I, I know uh, um, my friend Frank Frank Chimero did uh, did something similar to that recently where he um, he he basically had a, had a presentation and he kind of wrote out an essay around it. Um, yeah. And something like that, I mean, it's, it's all about what's right for the medium. Um, if someone's going to take video of the presentation, that solves that too, but... Yeah, I always regret. Do you ever watch any of the videos after the fact? Anything that's been recorded of you? I have, and is I've, I have, and I've also listened to them for the purpose of giving the talk again. Um, yeah. Because usually I'll I'll give a talk at least a few times, and it's awful and painful. But then I remember the things that I said that I liked, and I try to you know remember those when I'm giving again, and also yeah. where it was bumpy. Yeah, I'm a. I regret nothing. I never, listen, <laughs> I never look back. I'm just like, fuck it, forget it. It's not gonna matter. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's how I roll. That's how I mm. roll. Down the road. Um, you talk a little bit about and maybe we'll end out this um session, but you talk a little bit about how your process has changed between uh, working at a design agency, which is you know very much go 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 deadline, it's the most magnificent deadline in the world, you know. <laughs> Can't move the deadline. It's only advertising, but someone's going to die. Um, to start up, which is very, um, you know, iterative, um, you know, uh, internally driven more so, I guess, mm -hmm. than external client. So you mentioned how that's kind of altered your process a little bit. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's uh, it's mostly just going from the kinds of deliverables that made sense before, which you know, when I was at an agency, were or more like uh, Photoshop comps um, and really static things. And this was also right around the time when responsive web design was becoming a much bigger movement. So I think that, you know, had I stayed at agencies, my deliverables probably would have had to change too because a static comp isn't really going to be representative of what a website needs to be. Um, but I think that uh, it, it was also sort of my, my approach to getting at a design idea, I realized that one way of depicting something was 
through a Photoshop comp, but there are many other ways. You know, I can write about it, I can tell stories, I can sketch, I can take photographs. There are so many different ways that I can get at uh, explaining an interface and explaining an idea that don't also include making the interface. So I can do things a lot faster by just getting the same thing that's in my head into other people's heads. Yeah, one of the most amazing things I'd ever seen um, when I worked at Big Spaceship, I worked with Daniel Mall, who's mm -hmm. super talented. And I know Dan. Yeah, he was trying to, um, I'll talk shit about him now. He was trying to um, explain this idea to a client and it was uh, it was more like honestly it was, it was a data structure idea it was like almost like a database implementation idea it was like you know something that's very I guess technical in in some degrees and he explained it through a story like literally wrote it all out as a narrative and had kind of mocked it up as like a story and when you went through it it totally made sense on on the whole like process and how things would fall one after the other and all these you know you know, even if you want to talk about like uh, business decisions or business logic or any of that kind of stuff. And it was probably the first time I'd ever seen anything articulated in that manner. Mm -hmm. And yet I couldn't find a single issue with it. I was like, this is brilliant. Like, I, I don't think we could do this for everything, but this totally made sense. And once again, that's a deliverable that normally you'd probably get like a, you know, a, a big document that's a technical document written with all the rules down. And he yep. totally articulated in a different way. And so when I start to see those things and when people share them too, people are being a little bit more open about sharing like their process or how they're doing those things. I, I get super excited because I to me it feels like people are opening up to new processes and new approaches and who cares? Like who cares what you think should be the deliverable? As long as it's getting the end task done and if that's communicating, then it's doing a good job. Yep. Yeah, and I think I think that's probably something that I've I've taken out of uh, working for startups too, is that um, your deliverable is going to change depending upon what it is that you're trying to communicate, and that's okay. I think that, you know, at an agency you kind of fall into a process that you stick to each time because it's something that's predictable and easier to sell um, when you're specking out a job, but once you're internal and you just have um, your friends and they're the only ones you have to answer to, your coworkers, uh, you know, whatever, whatever's going to communicate something best is what you do, and if that means, you know, drawing on the wall or putting on a puppet show, that's what you do. <laughs> Hold on, I brought my puppet right there. <laughs> I'm really good at it, trust me. And you get down behind the, behind the table. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would totally do that. Yeah. Um, do you think that, like, in terms, of, so coming from, like, design agency, do you think that um, some of the reasons for those deliverables are, I mean, once again, they're selling a process, right? So they're selling it to a client, and most clients, you know, aren't, they're depending on that same process that they're used to, so they're depending on a discovery phase, they're depending on three sets of comps and being able to decide or, you know, however you might have, and they're, you know, uh, we're going to get this uh, document that we sign off on and all those kind of things. Um, do you think that for, for agencies, they need to, I mean, I think internally how you do stuff might be quite different than how you show it to a client. But do you think agencies uh, in general need to kind of work a little bit more with clients to kind of open them up to, you know, removing those kind of like static PSDs for a responsive site? Like, yeah. You know? I, 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 think, I think so, but I, I also know that this is one of the reasons that I wanted to get away from client work because it was a difficult battle to fight, and it wasn't necessarily that I had a better answer either. Um, I think that whether or not you know you're showing someone a flat comp or uh, you know a mocked up web page or something, that's fine. I think it's all the unknown stuff. Um, the dangerous thing is like when a client comes to you and they're like, "I need to communicate X," and you tell them that that's going to be a website because your company makes websites. It doesn't necessarily mean that a website is the best thing that that you know is to communicate. Uh, that's the part that I would get tripped up at and it's because you can't sell that super easily, you know? You can't say, give us this money, we don't know what we're going to give you yet, but, you know, we gotta get started in order to find out what that is. Um, I can't think of many industries that, that can work that way really well, um, where you can, where you're only basing everything off of your reputation for, you know, putting stuff online in the past. Uh, you know, if you went into a restaurant and and you're just like, I don't know, maybe there'll be food at the end of this. We'll see. 
<laughs> maybe not. Uh, yeah, maybe not. Um, I, I don't think that would work out too well. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think that's also a reason why prototyping, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of more of an agency space as opposed to other places. Um, I think it's changing for sure. Like it's fully changing, but I think it's one of those things why it, it was a hard thing to kind of get people started on and doing um, because it's, it, it can't be a line item. It's just it can't. You can't say to a client, "Oh, we're going to prototype this." We don't know what we're going to discover. We don't know the purpose of it quite yet. Like we're hoping to, you know, make sure that we're going to do some discovery and and you know, and mitigate some risk with it. Mm -hmm. But no one wants to pay for that as a line item. And so you know, I think that's why you know, part of that has been a struggle because all clients want to hear that you're prototyping, but all clients want to also hear that they're not paying for it. Yeah, and also I think the thing that's that's tough too is uh, a lot of clients come to you knowing what they want yeah. or at least having a notion of what it is that they think they should be getting. Um, and part of just the process of client work is showing them that it might not be that, that thing that they came in with, you know, yeah, and that's a that's a hard, hard, hard thing to change. Because yeah. you get clients, especially now, you get clients who they hear like responsive, you know, responsive design right now is such a big thing, and it becomes dangerous almost because clients come in and they're like, "Well, I want a responsive site," mm -hmm. and it's like, "Okay, so you already know what you want. You have no idea about any of the rest of it. You just know that it should be, you know, on all devices, for example." And so you start having those conversations where it becomes really hard. Um, have you have you experienced any words kind of like that? I would say maybe responsive design is one of them. Um, I'm sure there's tons other, but terms that maybe clients start to use that start to worry you a little bit, like any kind of signals or um, anyone for that matter. When you hear something where you're like, oh, this is not, you know, we have to educate or we have to figure out, you know, what you mean by that. Sure. Well, I, it's it's never really the industry's never really had anything but that. It's always something. It's always whatever is happening at the time. There was a time when clients all wanted splash pages. There was a time when clients wanted to take over your screen and didn't want you to be able to click out of the browser. There, I mean, there, there's always something um, that clients are going to want because um, you know this is their website and they think that it might be the most important website to ever be on the internet. Um, and it's a tough thing to wrestle that away, you know. It's always yeah. going to be their their personal pet project and possibly the thing that they're uh, they're standing behind internally on their side. Yeah, I mean that's that's just the reality of clients, right? Yep. Um, okay, one last question. Uh, any any work that you've seen in the last year or two years? whether it be an essay someone's written, something on Medium, a website, uh, an app, whatever, anything that you just, you absolutely love and wish everyone knew about? Hmm. Hmm. Think wisely, because this says a lot about you. Yeah, I know. No, I, I uh, my brain is, a, is completely a sieve anymore, and I can't think of anything without going through, like, my most recent bookmarks. It's, yeah, it's, it's awful. Um, I, I think I'm I, all, all of the stuff that's been happening um, uh, around. I think some of the uh, um, the equality around uh, what, like communities online, I find mm -hmm. very fascinating, and I don't have anything to necessarily add to the conversation. But I'm, I'm very interested in um, in not only having you know diversity uh, represented in our industry because our industry is so diverse and there isn't a whole lot of representation at um, not only you know the leaders of companies but on boards of executives, uh, speakers at conferences, the whole gamut. But I, I think I'm, I'm most fascinated with what's being spoken about there um, and doing you know very small things that I can to, to, help, to help balance things better. That's a good answer. I'll accept that. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure there's concrete stuff too, the articles that I love, but I'm just not thinking of anything at the moment. No, no, it's, it's, it's supposed to put you on the spot. It's all good. Okay. All right, that's it. Um, so that's all I got with uh, Jason Santamaria. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for, um, for doing this, Jason. I appreciate it. Sure, thank you. All right.